you for joining us. Good evening. It's great to see all of you. My name is Liz Brailsford, President and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. Welcome you speakers to Dallas. Uh, thank you for coming to the 2023 Bill and Barbara Benick Human Dignity for All Lecture. Our program tonight features former ambassadors at large for religious freedom, Sam Brownback and Rabbi David Saperstein, and president of the Lantos Foundation for Human Rights and Justice, Dr. Katrina Lantos Sweat, uh, moderated by Dr. Bob Roberts. I want to extend my deep gratitude to Bill and Barbara Bennett for their sponsorship of this event. Each year, we gather to promote civil discourse, equality, and human dignity, hallmarks of the founding of our council 72 years ago. We are fortunate to have your continued support throughout the years, and so we really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to acknowledge the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum and my friend Mary Pat Higgins. Thank you so much for hosting us tonight in your beautiful space and for being a promotional partner. And I also would like to extend our gratitude to other partners, promotional partners, American Jewish Committee of Dallas, the Alliance for Religious Freedom of DFW, and the Thanksgiving Foundation. Thank you. And also, always to our council's institutional members, AT&T, Dallas Baptist University, Dallas College, Harwood International, Haynes & Boone, Lockheed Martin, NEC Corporation of America, PNC Bank, and Sidley Austin, our newest member. We have a couple of schools in attendance today, so welcome. It's really important that we have our students here. We want to engage with you. Thank you to Trinity Valley School and Ursuline Academy of Dallas. Thank you. And also thank you to Linda and Richard Schaefer for their generous support of our education program, our Global Young Leaders, uh, which provides opportunities for students and teachers to engage with us. And again, that's really important. Please join us. If you're not a member, there's something for everyone. We do around 70 public programs every year. We have four pillars of work. This is just one of them. We welcome you. We need you. And please check out our membership options at dfwworld.org. And with that, I want to welcome my friend, Mary Pat Higgins, the president and CEO of the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. Please join me in welcome here. Always nice to be welcomed by a good friend. And so wonderful to have you all in our home tonight. As Liz says, I have the joy of being the president and CEO of the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. And when we were building this museum, which we opened in 2019, we dreamed of being a place where we could um, welcome partners to have programs like this. And so it's really heartwarming to have Dallas World Affairs Council here tonight. And I'm so excited that we are now official partners and we'll be doing an event here every year. So it's just um, really wonderful when organizations with such alignment in their missions to come together. The mission of our museum is to teach the history of the Holocaust and advance human rights to combat prejudice, hatred, and indifference. Um, so the, the themes in tonight's talk about human dignity and fairness, religious liberty, all align very, very closely with our mission. If you haven't visited the museum yet, I encourage you to come back, plan three or four or five hours, and um, come see us. We're open every day except for Tuesdays from 10 to 6. But we would love for you to come and go through the journey and become part of our family too. We are doing good work to try to stop the you know alarming increase of hate groups, of indifference, of, of the lack of civil discourse, all of the things that tonight's program are trying to promote, um, we are trying to promote too. So please come visit us and um, I look forward to seeing you all. And now it's my pleasure to welcome Bill Bennett, who is also a dear friend of the museums and of mine and the sponsor of tonight's program. So many welcomes. <laughs> I don't want to drag this out, but I would like to thank you all very much for coming. Uh, 
I know, I think I know most of you. I'm so grateful to be able to in introduce you to some of our other friends, my friends who are here from elsewhere in the country. Uh, and I'll make this very short. We have their resumes on the website. So uh, first of all, I'd like to, well, let's go from left to right. Sam Brownback, who uh, has served in the US uh, House of Representatives, in the Senate. He's been the governor of uh, uh, Kansas. He was the uh, ambassador of religious freedom under the Trump administration. And currently, he has two or three organizations. He's the chairman of, chairman or co-chairman of the International Religious Freedom Summit, the National Committee for Religious Freedom, and so forth. So Sam, thank you. For, we'll, we'll wait until I introduce everybody here before we applaud. And, uh, next, we have Katrina Lanto Sweat, who is, uh, these are all just great dear friends of mine. Thank you all so much for being here. And Katrina uh, has been uh, the, uh, she was the, let me get this title right, the president of Lantos Foundation for Human Rights. She, uh, her father is the only Holocaust survivor to serve in the U.S. Congress. Katrina is also uh, the uh, chairman of the U United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. She's received the Knight's Cross Award in Hungary, and she, uh, I'll just say one other thing, and that is that she might, are the youngest graduate from Yale? I don't know. She went to Yale when she was 16 years old, got her law degree there, and a whole slew of other college degrees. Next, we have Ambassador Saperstein, and he, in addition to having been a rabbi, and still a rabbi, having practiced uh, for 35 years as a rabbi and attorney, uh, has been the uh, president of the World Union of Progressive Judaism. He was the ambassador for uh, religious freedom, international religious freedom under the Tr Obama administration. And uh, we're very grateful to have him. Finally, I'd like to introduce Bob Roberts, also a very dear friend who I love dearly. Bob has been the pastor of uh, one of the largest churches I certainly ever seen for 30 years out in Keller, Texas, and has formed several international organizations where he works very hard right now and devotes all of his time. The uh, something called Glo Glocknet, which has to do with international religious freedom, an organization called the Multi Faith Neighbors Network, which does work across the whole world. Bob is. Uh, very involved and led his church for over 30 years, and now he's very engaged with many other religious organizations. So that's our group of four, three panelists and the moderator for tonight. I'd like everybody to give both them and Mary Pat Higgins, who has provided this wonderful space for us, and Liz Brailsford, the chairman of the World Affairs Council, a big round of applause. One last thing while you're coming up uh, is we have a book for everybody here. It's about all about human dignity and human rights across the world with some wonderful photographs. We've got one for everybody. If we're out, just leave your business card at the desk and we'll send you one. I don't know about you, but I love Bill Binnick. I think he's an awesome man. Now, Bill, that's as close as you're going to have as a Southern Baptist pastor saying something good about an LDS. <laughs> revel in it, man. Revel in it. Yeah, I do. I think the world of him. It's so funny. I grew up in deep East Texas. Do we have any real Texans here tonight? Uh, my family goes all the way back to the Alamo. And who would have known that I'd be friends and... Uh, Nearly killed Sam Brown back today and with my driving techniques. Dallas traffic. Yeah, that's right. Our, our David Saperstein, a Georgetown lawyer, uh, on my less than Baptist days, I would just say I frustrate the hell out of him sometimes because, uh, well, I just do. But I love him, and he loves me, and he means the world to me. And I, it comes to you now. It does. I can't help it. I can't help it. And then... Uh, Dr. Sweat, I am so grateful to you and what you do, and it's an honor to have you here tonight. We care about religious freedom. I'm a Baptist. It's in our history. It's in our roots. It matters to us. I, I want it to matter more. I feel like, I feel like we've lost the passion with, within my own tribe for religious freedom. 
uh, like we used to have. And I want to see that restored and brought back. And I know these three do. And it matters to them. Every single one of them could be on boards, making lots of money, doing a lot of different things. You're, you're highly educated. Uh, you've been very successful in life. And uh, the way I would say it, God has used you uh, to make a difference in the world. But here you choose to do this. Why? Why do you do it, Ambassador Brownback? Um, well, you know, first, thank you and thank everybody for being here. This is a beautiful crowd uh, and wonderful people that are here. It, it, gets, it gets in your blood and it gets me, it's a calling. Um, you just, I remember the first person that when I was in the U.S. Senate, we got out of jail that was a religious prisoner in Uzbekistan, and I get a call. Uh, I'm at one of my kids' ball games. I get a call, and the staff member says, hey, they just got out of jail. We got somebody out of jail. And I go, really? And I'd written to the president of Uzbekistan. I didn't, who, who, I didn't know him. Uh, he's a tough guy, but let him out. Uh, and off the letter, I did, or that was a part of it anyway. And I just go, Wow. I mean, we could actually do something like that. Let's do more. Uh, and here tonight, the, the Peter Pan group that got out a bunch of us worked to get uh, the folks out of that, uh, that situation. And you're just going, when one of them gets out, it's just like a, a, a rush of, we did something good for the world uh, in doing that. These people are just locked up because of their faith. And that, that's all they're locked up for. If they, if they were like everybody else, every life just goes on. But you're going, well, that's your right. That's your human dignity to choose what to do with your own soul. And we should stand up and fight for that. And that's, as a, that's more American than apple pie and hot dogs. It's better than hot dogs. But uh, that's more American uh, because this is what founded the country. And we're the only place on the planet that can do what we're doing. And if we don't do it, nobody will get it done. It really is us. And what a proud heritage and what a great, great calling. Well, I would also like to thank our hosts, thank Bob Roberts, thank the beautiful Holocaust Museum you have here. And um, it's always a wonderful day for me when I can be with these two incredibly distinguished um, and heroic fighters for freedom of religion, conscience, and belief. I think as I try to answer your question, Bob, and it's, it's really a very important one, I do turn to my own family's history. As was mentioned, I'm the daughter of the only Holocaust survivor ever to serve in the United States Congress. And I'd like to very quickly tell you a story from my father's life when he was a young teenage boy in Hungary. And like other Jewish boys, um, after the occupation of Hungary by Germany, he was rounded up and sent to a slave labor camp. This was still in Hungary. He hadn't been deported yet. And in the particular barracks where he was living, the individual who was in charge of that barracks decided that he was going to burnish his reputation in some strange and perverse way by forcing all the Jewish boys in that barracks to convert to Christianity. Now, my dad was not a particularly religious um, boy at that time, a teenager, although he did have a faith that later through the terrible experiences of his life, evolved into a, a much more skeptical agnosticism in his adulthood. But somehow, at that early time in his life, there was something he understood about his own personal soul freedom, integrity of his soul, that, that resisted this. But of course, it was very dangerous to resist this. And so all the boys in the barracks did end up converting, all except for two. My father and, and his best friend at the time. And they were badly beaten for their refusal to, to give up what was a very profound part of their identity. Now, as I look back at the life my father subsequently lived, he survived the Holocaust, he came to the United States, he was eventually elected to Congress, and he really did become sort of the conscience of the Congress in many ways. He established the Congressional Human Rights Caucus and became a great fighter and defender of human rights for all people around the world. 
But as I look back, I like to think that that moment when something stirred in his soul that told him he would be giving up something of infinite worth if he allowed his freedom of conscience to be overridden by the danger, by the threat, by the violence that was directed at him, and he didn't let it happen. And I think that moment really did play an extraordinary part in, in the person he eventually became. And so I do believe that nothing speaks to our, our dignity. And I know that that's this lecture and this series is, is grounded in this idea of human dignity. Nothing speaks to our dignity more profoundly than the right to live our lives according to the dictates of our own conscience. And we were lucky to hear a brave young man tonight tell us about a whole community that were also threatened, that also faced persecution and, and intimidation. But that, that belief that they had was more important to them than the convenience or the ease or being able to avoid terrible consequences. And so, for me at least, this fight um, finds its roots in a brave father in a terrible time, um, and also in the promise that our country, with its might and its power and its principles and its protections, gives us and, and the responsibility to, to try and advance that for others. Well, amen to both of these uh, stories. It, uh, you're absolutely right, Sam. That feeling of every person that we got out um, here, every law that we made a little bit better, what an extraordinary feeling it is. You know you're touching the lives of people at their most needy moments and in danger of seeing their dreams squashed and because of what you did. Their lives are different for the better because of that. And your father, you know, was a friend and a hero to so many of us uh, in terms of what he represented uh, here. And we're really with one of the great advocates for um, uh, religious freedom uh, who's moderating this. Uh, the answer about why is, I would ask you to think with me just for a moment about the meaning of this extraordinary institution that we are sitting in. 11 million people butchered by the Nazis. Six million Jews, one third of the entire Jewish population on earth. The world simply didn't believe Hitler from 33 until the beginning of the war or into the war in terms of what he had to say about those who were inferior to Aryans and their lack of dignity, their lack of rights. The lesson of this institution is twofold. It is what happens when people of conscience remain silent in the face of injustice, in the face of persecution, in the face of ethnic cleansing, in the face of genocide. And it is a story of the hundreds of thousands of Jews and others who were saved because individuals of conscience hid them or diplomats acted to save them and people rallied to their behalf. It was too small a number, but for every one of those hundreds of thousands, there are now a couple of million descendants of those people who survived because of people of conscience who made a difference. You can't fix everything, but each of us can respond to what the passions of our heart is to do the best we can to help save lives, to help protect freedoms. And just consider this, Freedom House tells us that from 1945 at the end of the war through 2006, with all of the diverse experiences around the world, on a global level, the midpoint of the ebbs and flows was it ongoing increase in democracy and human rights. And since 2006, that midpoint has gone back in the opposite direction in terms of the growth of autocracy, the repression of democracy, the repression of religious freedom, the repression of all human rights. What's going to be the rest of the direction the world will go in? Well, it's people like us who will help make that decision. 
So when you ask Bob, why are we in this? It is to save those lives. It is to enhance freedom. It's to preserve democracy. And it's to make a difference in the world to do God's work here on earth. You make me want to say amen to all of you. That's awesome. Now you see that clock right there. I did not want to speed anybody up because I wanted you to speak uh, from your heart. But now you got to speak from your head because we've got about 20 minutes. So I want to ask you a bunch of questions fast. First of all, Sam Brownback, what is the date for the Earth Summit? What is the Earth Summit? I got to explain my socks first. These are my Kansas City Chiefs socks. So in case you were looking and wondering, I, I, I mean, and I'm sorry. I mean, the Chiefs are owned by a good Dallas family here, so you should be happy about that. I'm sorry about your Cowboys on Sunday. You know, it happens. Uh, but anyway, the Chiefs won. Um, the summit is uh, January 29th and 30th. Uh, the Earth Summit is the largest gathering of religious freedom activists in the world annually. This will be our fourth one. It's right two days, or it's the two days right before the National Prayer Breakfast in Washington, D.C. at the Washington Hilton. And if you're interested in this topic and you want to start connecting with the global movement on it, come to it. We'd love to have you there. We'd love to have you connect into us. What we have to create is a global grassroots movement of people standing for religious freedom for everybody, everywhere, all the time. We don't talk theology. We talk human rights. And this is the human right of the soul, is religious freedom. Your right to choose to do with your own soul. Or you may choose, I don't want to pick any religion. Great, that's your right. And it should be defended and fought for. And that's what we fight for, and that's what we're doing. So you and Dr. Sweat do that together. You're both Republicans, I assume, and oh, both whoa, conservative. Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. I'm, I'm teasing. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a very bipartisan affair, and I was very honored. Um, the Earth Summit really is Sam's brainchild, and he's done an extraordinary job and has really been the moving force. But very rightly and correctly, he felt... Um, which should be the case with all human rights causes, that this should be an entirely bipartisan and really nonpartisan cause. And so I have pretty good democratic bona fides. <laughs> and um, I was really very grateful when he reached out and gave me the opportunity to join him as co-chair. But we really, we do try to cover the waterfront. And I'll just say, to give you a sense of how comprehensive it is, we have, of course, representatives from almost every faith you can imagine. I don't know anyone that isn't represented there. But I was particularly pleased because at the 2023 summit, the American Atheists of, or the Atheists of America, I'm not sure I've got the, their title correctly, also decided to be, not only to come, but to be a partner. And I think that really, it spoke very well for them because it indicated that they too respect what it means to defend the rights, conscience rights of all people. But it also spoke well for the overwhelmingly faith-oriented people who participate in the summer to understand and wrap their heads around the fact that that, that is that essence of human dignity. So we really kind of cover the waterfront. Yeah, just to add a footnote to the bipartisan uh, question here. Um, almost every great social achievement in America in the 20th century happened because of a bipartisan coalition of decency on Capitol Hill and multiracial, multireligious, multiethnic um, uh, coalition, the multireligious coalitions of decency in every community across America. The breakdown of bipartisanship is one of the greatest threats to the future of the world and to the future of America at this particular time. But this issue is one of the few that still enjoys overwhelming bipartisan support. So Sam Brownback and I have very different political views um, here, and uh, the two of us are a bit closer together. But in the spirit, I decided to wear my red tie um, today. <laughs> you knew you were in Texas. I if everybody's you. talking about their clothes, I feel like I'm supposed to say something. Oh, we've got socks, we've got a tie. This is a new skirt, so, you know, how about a round of applause for my new skirt? You know, that's all I can say. And you're really sad for St. Patrick's Day. Oh, yes, oh, yeah, there yes, you yes, go. yes, I am. 
<laughs> David, I want to ask you two questions, and, and if you would give uh, brief answers because they're both important questions. Just a little education to help people understand the difference between the IRF office and the State Department, of which you and Ambassador Brownback were, and the IRF Commission, of which Dr. Sweat was the head of. So when the International Religious Freedom Act was passed um, in 1998, um, it, was, it had three major components, or a lot of other pieces of it, three major components. It mandated an annual report of every country in the world and how it was doing on religious freedom, which is, provides guideposts not just for American diplomats, but other countries can't do it. They use our report. It's kind of their um, blueprint of uh, the status of religious freedom and who's being persecuted and what their needs are, et cetera. Secondly, it created a, uh, a at the level of an ambassador at large, an ambassador with global responsibilities, um, the office that uh, that Sam Brownback and I were on it to, um, uh, to head. And to be sure that this work was going to be done right, um, it created an independent a commission, U.S. Commission on International um, Religious Freedom, um, which Katrina had served as the uh, as one of the past chairs, did a fantastic job in that work. And it kind of watches how the executive branch and the Congress are doing on this, and it makes recommendations every year about what can be done better. Um, and the interaction of those three entities, that report that engages in every embassy across the country, are foreign service officers to reach out to persecuted groups, discriminated groups, to really put pressure on the government to make things better. Um, the entire structure of the State Department and the independent commission watching what the White House and the Congress does in making recommendations creates that powerful force that uh, the ambassador referred to or easily, which America has become both a moral go to the conscience of the world on this issue, but also a blueprint of what country other countries can do. And we're now seeing more ambassador level, ministerial level people in this work and much more engagement in the world thanks to the leadership you provided during your tenure creating this broad alliance of uh, countries here. So that's the structure. Let, let me ask you one more question if I could. Uh, under your tenure, you started something that is spread around the world, uh, Religious Freedom Roundtables. We started one in our country and now they're all over the world. And under Ambassador Brownback uh, was started uh, this Religious Freedom Conference. And there's still the ministerial that continues, but there's also the civil society that, that uh, Ambassador Brownback and Dr. Sweat give leadership to. Why is that Earth Conference, you're deeply involved, why is it so important? There, there's so much going on around the world that A, Getting everyone together who are key activists about this is so encouraging because the, the agenda is so overwhelmingly enormous. It is such a shot in the arm for us to be together in solidarity with each other. Secondly, there are all kinds of different approaches, tactics, strategies going on, and best practices are being shared in this conference um, all together. And third, it gets attention from other countries countries around the world um, uh, here. So the civil society groups that created the roundtable, it wasn't us who created the roundtable. It was the civil society groups, the NGO groups themselves who said, we've got to coordinate uh, uh, better as the government's trying to coordinate. We have to do a better job. And we really both reached out to engage with them and interact with them to make it a stronger whole. So that conference really has this enormous impact to bringing civil society, governmental entities, players from all across the globe together, an enormous shot in the arm, learning of best practices um, uh, here, and giving hope to oppressed groups everywhere around the world. And you're all welcome to attend. There's registration. There's a website. We'd love to have you. Ambassador Brownback, what do you see as the biggest threat to religious freedom around the world today? That's hard to pick because you pick up the newspaper today and you got Armenian Christians being run out by Azerbaijan and Turkey in a, in a genocidal act taking place today. You've got a radical communist Chinese regime you just heard about that's gotten far worse and is at war with faith. 
Uh, in India, you've got, unfortunately, now a, a kind of a, in some places, a militant uh, movement to really attack after uh, Christians and Sikhs and and uh, Muslims in that country. And you've got a, a Rohingya. Where's the Rohingya gentleman that's here uh, tonight? Uh, a genocide uh, from Burma or Myanmar uh, that they got kicked out um, there. What? I don't know that there is one, but one thing we do agree upon here is that one of the answers to this is religious freedom for everybody because genocides and ethnic cleansing almost always happens to religious minorities. That's who gets genocide is a religious minority. That's the Rohingya or Muslims in a dominant uh, uh, Buddhist country. Uh, it's not exclusively that way, but those are issues we can push back against. And, you know, I just want to make one little comment. If we think about the United States and our pretty extraordinary record on religious freedom, I would suggest that part of the secret sauce to our tremendous success as a nation did have to do with the absolutely revolutionary idea we had at our beginning, embodied in the First Amendment. It was unheard of anywhere in the world at that time, the idea that you would, on the one hand, protect the free exercise of religion, but at the same time, prevent an establishment of religion. It was a revolutionary idea. I think it was really the difference maker as we see American history unfold and we see to a remarkable degree the way we generation over generation built an increasingly respectful, tolerant, pluralistic society, not without many hiccups and many setbacks and many moments of hypocrisy and failure to be sure. And one of the things, you know, we are moved, each one of us, by the very tragic human dimension of this massive repression of, of religious freedom and conscience rights around the world. But it is also something that hurts the societies that engage in this. Terribly. There is remarkable social science evidence that shows that societies that do a good, a robust job of protecting freedom of religion, conscience, and belief, they're more prosperous, they're more peaceful, something that's quite important to me, women have higher socioeconomic status in those societies. So, and from a national security perspective for the United States, we, some of the biggest threats and challenges to us in a national security sense come from countries where religious freedom is, is crushed, repressed, um, and just doesn't exist. So, you know, that's another dimension of why this cause makes so much sense. It makes moral sense. We don't need to persuade anybody on the moral argument, but it also makes enormous practical sense. I, uh, pardon me for jumping in out of order, but I'm sure a lot of you saw the Oppenheimer movie. Yes. And can you believe what Hitler kicks out the Jews, and it doesn't go into physics because that's the Jewish science. What a dumb idea and move. And I'm looking, and who was the beneficiary of that? Yeah. Us and the free world. That, I mean, that, that, to me, really galvanized the issue of the beauty of our country. We, we take all comfort, and we do it wrong a lot of times, and there's prejudice. I, you know, it goes on, but by and large, this is our DNA, and this is what we try to get right, and we have benefited enormously by it. So in terms of the greatest threats, um, I, I'd sum it up to say there are three. Religious extremism. And let me be clear, I'm not talking about theology. I don't care how fundamentalist you are, how liberal you are. Religious extremists are willing to use force to impose their religious views on others. It may be governmental force if they control the government. It may be violent force and terrorism um, that they're willing uh, to use. And there's not parity between the rest of us and them because we don't go killing people we have religious differences with. They're willing to kill people they have religious um, uh, uh, differences with. Secondly, the growth of autocracies. Autocratic governments are frightened 
by people's willingness and, and commitment to organize their existence around ideas that the autocratic government can't control. They're frightened and terrified and they'll move to quash that kind of independent thinking um, here. So autocratic governments, uh, secondly. And third, the, uh, the uh, restrictions across the globe on broader human rights. You can't have religious freedom if you don't have freedom of speech and you don't have freedom in the pulpit and you don't have freedom to proselytize if that's your um, belief. You can't have freedom of speech if you don't have freedom in the press. So you can't publish your holy books, you can't publish your educational books, you can't have freedom of the press if you don't have the right of association. The very nature of almost all religions is based on a right of association, like like-minded people. So this attack on human rights um, uh, there is always going to destroy religious freedom um, here. And of course, conversely, you're never gonna have other human rights if you don't have the freedom of conscience. That's at the core of what religious freedom is about. So those three factors are the greatest dangers to religious freedom today. He's a smart man, isn't he? As I look over this room, Bill, what is the name? Of, we started it together. I was a part of the little task force when we started our religious freedom gathering here. What do you call it now? I wanted to say it right, DFW Alliance for Religious Freedom. I saw the Wilberforce Group. How many of you represent organizations that deal with religious freedom that are here in some capacity? Now, all right, here's a lady. Here's look, look all over this room. So, Dr. Sweat, at the Earth Conference, it's really not just a matter of listening to people talk. You, you mentioned best practices. I'd like to pick up on this idea that Ambassador Brownback talked about. We want to work together. We want to partner, government and civil society. What impact can these people have that are in this room tonight in being a part of this? Well, first of all, we would really encourage you um, to consider joining with us as partners, as sponsors of the, the summit, because it is the premier international religious freedom event in the world. And um, when, uh, when Sam Brownback started it, he used to use the tagline that we're the Davos of international religious freedom. And I think we're better than Davos because we aren't um, quite so elite, but we are focused on actually trying to, to make a difference in the world. One of the things um, that you'll find if you decide to join us and, and become part of it is, first of all, you have the opportunity to help shape the programming and, and help us know what are the cutting edge issues we need to focus on. So for each summit, we really have sort of this brain trust where we try to, to zero in on a whole range of new challenges. I mean, we know the basic landscape, the underlying challenges, but every year brings a new set of sort of, of potential threats. You know, what impact does internet freedom have on, on, um, on religious freedom? Technology is posing all kinds of new threats. Um, the loss of privacy, the intrusion of, of uh, you know, these surveillance states that are emerging everywhere. I talked earlier about the intersection of national security and religious freedom. But one of the things, and I think for any of you who join us and, and choose to join us really as partners, one of the most inspiring aspects of the summit is the way Everybody there catches the vision that the rights of one are the rights of all. And some of the most uplifting occasions are those um, breakout sessions or those panels where we have Muslims advocating for the rights of Jews, you know, speaking out against anti-Semitism, where we have Buddhists standing up and speaking on behalf of, of uh, you know, Hindus. And, you know, you name it. And that, you know, those are the moments when I say we're getting it. We really do get it, because without that profound respect for everybody's right to follow that voice of conscience in their own lives, we're sort of missing the point. But, uh, but it's very practical. We also try and have had some success um, of course, to engage policymakers in Washington, D.C. We, you know, secretaries of state, we had um, Samantha Power, the head of um, USAID, we've had Speaker Pelosi, we've had, um, you know, just in our most recent summit, we had the new chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Congressman McCall. We really make an effort to sort of put our issues, put our agenda on their radar screen. Once they come, once they interact at the summit, 
it's no longer just kind of a sidebar issue that they push aside. We've had some success with trying to get actual legislative initiatives introduced that magnify the work we're trying to do. So, I mean, I could go on and on, but, but an awful lot of real work gets done, real connections are made, and real momentum is built globally for the cause. We're out of time, but I want to ask one more question, Ambassador Brown, back to you, if I could. We're living in a time in the U.S. of polarization, and yet I'm on a Zoom group with pastors from all over the world. They're experiencing this in their countries as well. Sometimes the challenge is not the other faith, but it's those faiths that are closest to us. Like, I'm a Baptist. We grew up with very negative views with LDS. That was wrong. The, the reality is we just should have said, we disagree. We didn't have to be that way. And I look in the world, what's going on with Ahmadiyya and the Ismailis and, and other religious minorities where it's intra-faith. Uh, I'm sure you both have been to Pakistan. You know what's, what's going on there. How, how do we respond to this? How do we get to a point where we don't have to vilify people we disagree with? Like you said earlier at the beginning, you don't even have to believe in God. You know, I'd like to baptize everybody, but at the end of the day, the reality is, what would you say about this moment that we're living in right now of polarization and yet the opportunity to stand up, sometimes against your own tribe, to push back? Yeah, it's, you know, Bob, everybody complains about the Congress being divided, but you've got to remember, actually, it's a representative government and the government's just really representing where the people are. And the people are divided. Uh, I, I'm not defending it. Um, and I pray against that spirit of division on a regular basis myself. And I hope you pray against that. But I think the best thing, honestly, people can do and people in this crowd can do, I mean, is, is try to encourage a bipartisanship uh, and then display it yourself. Uh, reach out to somebody that's not like you and start doing something with them. I mean, it's that it's that example. And here, I mean, you're in a major city in America. It, it, you're in a major state in America, and you've got global reach by a bunch of companies that are headquartered here. You are not without influence. You're not a little place. I grew up in Parker, Kansas, and I don't know if anybody here could identify it on a map. And we weren't on some maps, we were so small. But uh, I wouldn't just necessarily look out and complain about it. I'd start just reaching out and the next person you can find and figure out to do something with that's different uh, from you that you feel called to do, do it. And then and start showing a different way. And can I just say one thing? Because you, you mentioned sort of your upbringing and you know, just some of those negative ideas that many communities have about each other. But I think one thing that most people of faith could share in common is this idea of, of freedom of conscience. And there is actually a very beautiful um, LDS hymn, and the words of it are very sim simple, but it says, know this, that every soul is free to choose his life and what he'll be, for this eternal truth is given that God will force no man to heaven. And, you know, I think that kind of a, again, there's a deep respect. There is a sense of, of seeing, you know, in our fellow beings, um, you know, someone of inestimable value with a mind and a spirit and a conscience given to them by God. And with that comes this precious freedom. So. So we really believe in, in that freedom. I, I could sing that song. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, you know, <clears throat> what was Dickens' opening line of A Tale of Two Cities? This is the best of times. This is the worst of times. We've been focusing on ways that this is the worst of times. But you've also got a sense that this can be the best of times. Um, there is more interfaith cooperation going on on the global level in, in across the world than at any point in human history. And America, again, is at the forefront of that with extraordinary into robust and, and effective um, interfaith efforts that are undertaken here. When we're willing to work together across religious lines, across uh, political lines, or whatever it is, we 
can be so much more effective than any one group can be alone. And when we work together that way, we're modeling the very kind of world we're trying to create. So when I ask, what can you do? That work together, modeling the world we're trying to create, standing in solidarity, standing in commitment to make a, wor a world's better for us, and as I said before, standing together to do God's work of justice and freedom and equality and peace here and across the globe. What finer lesson can there be about the difference we can make? Awesome. All right, some questions. Peter, I'm not going to embarrass you, but I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, by any chance, did we bring brochures tonight? Yes, I got them outside. Would you stand up, Peter? This is, this is Peter, and Peter works with Ambassador Brownback. And if you would be interested in being a sponsor, my organizations are, uh, if you would like to be a sponsor of the event, uh, you can do that. We would encourage you to be a part, to register, sign up. And uh, we would love if you wanted to be a serious partner, uh, if you visit with Peter Burns. Uh, he's very tall, even though he's, you may not be able to tell it down front, but he's very tall. If you'll grab him, he can give you all the information. They wanted me to do that because I'm a Baptist preacher and I'm taking up the offering. So, so anyhow, just if you want to be a part, help us out. All right, here's some questions. Uh, what are your thoughts? These are from some young people. And if some of the rest of you have questions uh, that you want to send up here, uh, send them up. Uh, Isai is somewhere, and he'll be happy to take them. Here's the first one. What are your thoughts and positions on the surge of polarizing extremists and the messaging that's taking place on social media platforms around the world? Anyone can answer that? <laughs> Well, that's a very tough one. You know, um, in the United States, we have the most <laughs> robust free speech sort of regime, if you will, of any country on the face of the earth. I lived for a few years in Denmark. My husband had the opportunity to serve as the American ambassador there. And um, Europeans were constantly kind of shocked and appalled at what free speech absolutists we were. And I would defend very proudly our our um, strong support for free speech. And I'm alarmed at uh, what I see on many college campuses where young people, you know, seem to be increasingly not interested in hearing things that make them uncomfortable or that they don't like. Uh, but having said that, we also are grappling with the, uh, with a whole new world, this world of social media where, um, you know, when I was a child, there were certain arbiters, certain kind of gatekeepers that uh, had a lot of responsibility for disseminating, for example, the news. And they, we had a level of trust in them, whether it was Walter Cronkite or Howard K. Smith or, you know, some other names from a, a very long ago era. And that, that has sort of all disappeared. And, and so I think, I, I don't think there are any easy answers to that question. I think we need to you know, stand um, certainly on the side of freedom of speech and especially freedom for unpopular speech. We all have to be willing to hear and listen and deal with uncomfortable things. Popular speech doesn't need protection. It's only unpopular speech that needs the, the protection of, of our First Amendment. But we, we also um, need to figure out how the Supreme Court standards enunciated in um, in some really important cases. I think it's Brandenburg. I see Brett Sharps from BYU Law School there, so he may correct me. And, and you know, there are some, some limitations, you know, immediate incitement to violence, things that can, you know, truly bring about harm. We all know the line about not yelling fire in a crowded theater. So social media has complicated the answer to that question. Um, people, many people with a lot more sophistication on this topic than I are wrestling with it on a daily basis. But I do think at the end of the day, there is also a parental responsibility um, to sort of have, have a role in what young and very impressionable people are exposed to. Um, and there is also a, a responsibility that each of us have not to get sucked into the vicious and demeaning tenor of so much that happens on social media. 
uh, my very distinguished friend to my left spoke about modeling what it is we want to see. And we need to model it in the way we interact with those that we may disagree with. Let me ask a question. I'm going to come back to you in a, a minute, Dr. Sweat. But I'm going to ask this for both Am Ambassador Brownback and Ambassador Saperstein. How can young people effectively spread awareness about religious freedom when some of the most influential people uh, alive, singers, actors, politicians in the world, find ways to use their power to spread hate? We have uh, some Vietnamese here, some cow dye. Would you guys stand up, the cow dye? So I want the young people here to just keep standing for just a minute. I want the young people here to take note of that. The cow dye are persecuted in Vietnam. It's a religious, it's a, a minor religious uh, sect. What you can do is pick somebody in your community. You guys can sit down uh, now if you'd, if you'd like. Uh, pick somebody in your community on a narrow, specific case and bring them to your school and highlight this is what's happening to the cow die in Vietnam and tell people about it. I've seen these social movements by young people really light up when young people start looking and saying, well, what's happening? Well, our temples are getting torn down. Our head priest is in jail. Uh, we, you, uh, my parents were there and they got kicked out and they, they start catching the vision for, you mean this is going on in our world today? Yes, it's going on in your world today. And these people are now in Dallas because they can't be at home. And they were kicked out. They were run out. And they got family members in jail and they're killed. And start just raising the awareness of this because I've, I've seen these things take off and then start networking on that same social media that we all get irritated at that's so effective on spreading the news. <laughs> start showing the, the cases and the, the pictures uh, of them or get to know the Mayflower Church uh, people that are, that are here and start telling that story or pick a community in some place that's being persecuted right now in Nigeria and rebuild their church for them, raise the money to rebuild the church for them because it probably got burned down by some terrorist. You know, there, I'll give you 100 cases myself if you want to pick one, uh, but you just can look around your community. Dallas is so international and has such a reach. You, you can pick them right here and go to it. Let me read something. Uh, literally, they handed it to me while you were speaking. We were the Vietnamese American community of faith. We'd like to thank Ambassador Brownback and Dr. Sweat for their nonstop effort uh, to, to work with the government to release many of the prisoners of conscience in Vietnam. Thank you. It was a fantastic thing. Uh, my wife tonight is with about uh, 15 Vietnamese educators from Hanoi, and they just came to the country. She teaches special ed, goes back and forth in Vietnam. So we love Vietnam, and we, we long for it to be a healthy place. Uh, Pastor Pan, would you stand? I want people to know who you are. He, stand up, would you? I have volunteered to go to East Texas and teach him how to hunt deer and squirrel and so forth. So. I'm excited to make him a real Texan and have some fun. So, David. Wait, wait, wait a minute. How many of you have eaten squirrel in this room and live in Texas? <laughs> now, I've eaten squirrel, but I, you know, I don't. Somebody well, calls a, him a, a rat, that's a, that's a rat a, with a good PR that's a program. That's a Baptist delicacy. That's a Baptist delicacy. I, I would, but it's not kosher. <laughs> <laughs> so, David, what would you say to young people? about this whole thing about polarization and pushing back. I mean, that, the question came from a young person. What do we do? Uh, I mean, I thought the answer that was given uh, is a very strong answer. Um, there are, in your houses of worship, there are youth groups. Those youth groups do programs. Add the religious freedom issue on any of the examples. Again, you don't have to do everything. Just do something um, there. Make sure this year 
that there's a program for your youth group in, in, on religious freedom, or the youth group hosts a program for the house of worship in its entirety um, on this issue. Um, you can make a difference that way. You can adopt a prisoner of conscience and really campaign for them. Write to your senators, your congresspersons, it makes a difference, right? You get these letters um, here, and it gets you to speak out and to really make a difference. I should tell you that Sam Brownback, when he was in the Senate, was fantastic on these issues. And we were across our political differences. We worked together on this, on human trafficking um, uh, here, on the Sudan Peace Act, on a whole range of issues that we found common ground. So you can push your senator and congressperson to speak out for the prisoner of conscience who you adopt um, uh, here. Spend some time online looking at these issues and learn about them so that you are more comfortable in talking about it. And challenge your friends, even if you don't do it publicly, when they make a joke about a minority of one kind or another, when they say something that's wrong, pull them aside afterwards and saying, you know, that's why hate's in the world, because people don't take seriously respecting the dignity and what it means in our religious traditions to call for us to love our stranger as ourselves. Um, uh, here, challenge your friends when the, uh, the, the, the jokes that convey messages of hate or the actions that they may do uh, here. And if you can't challenge them, then get together with friends and offer a counter message, a polite, non-confrontational um, in terms of any kind of violence or yelling or anything, but come across with a more effective kind of messages that conveys the values that you care about. So there's a whole range that all of us can do in our daily lives, in our group lives, um, in our community lives that can really make a difference. Last question for you, Dr. Sweat. It's specifically for you. Uh, someone asked, how did your education from other countries expand your knowledge on different cultures and religions? Well, the World Affairs Council is a, is a wonderful host sort of to, to set the umbrella for this. Um, you know, I, I do think that one of the things that we as Americans have to be sensitive to is a slight tendency towards parochialism. You know, we're a big country um, with a very diverse population. We still are the global leader in so many ways, but sometimes that can lead us to have a little bit of, a, of an insular view of this vast, rich, diverse, and, and very educational world that we want to be part of. So. I guess I'll, I'll sort of end with where I began. My father, as a young boy, before all the terrible events um, sort of intervened and, and befell him in his life, was a great fan of the author Jules Verne. And his favorite book by Jules Verne, some of you can probably guess, was Around the World in 80 Days. And he would tell me about how as a little boy, you know, to him that was just the ultimate adventure he could imagine to, to travel the world, which he eventually had the opportunity to do in his life. But he also used to say to me, the world is like a book and those who never travel read only one page. Um, many years ago, and I hope things have improved since then, there was a terrible sort of little factoid that was reported in the press. And basically it was that something like only a third of the members of the United States Congress had a passport. I found that shocking. Um, you know, that, and again, it speaks to sort of this sense of, well, what does, what does the world have to teach me? So I guess I would say that I have learned an enormous amount in my life um, from traveling, from um, learning other languages, from learning other cultures. And one of the most important things I have learned is humility. And I think that that's a very important virtue in life, the virtue of humility, understanding that, that you have things to learn, that the way that you have always understood and done things isn't the only way, that the way you have you know, looked at the world isn't the only way of looking at the world. And I think humility would also go a long way towards 
solving the, the problem that your previous question asked about this bitter division and bitter hostility and this insistence on painting those with whom we disagree, not as our worthy opponent, but as our arch enemy. And so I, I love the question. Um, it gives me a chance to sort of reminisce again about my father, um, but, but just that, that sense of adventure also that we have when we are open to this wonderful, beautiful world, a world I believe that a, a loving God created for all of us um, and, uh, and we're failing to take advantage of, of one of the beautiful gifts he's offered us if we don't embrace it all. So thank you. Thank you for the So question. we conclude, let me challenge everyone, build a relationship with someone that's different from you. You may disagree with them, but you won't have the same view of them once you become their friend. Thank you very much. If you'll, if, if you'll stay there for just a moment, and uh, what a scary stat. A third of Congress has a passport. Holy moly. Uh, but thank you also for reinforcing the fact that Dallas is very global. We also believe this, and thank you for saying that and mentioning that. And But uh, most importantly, thank you for that incredibly powerful and inspiring conversation. This is why we exist, to have a group of people, to have a diverse audience, and to have a group of people who have different perspectives, and we come together in a bipartisan or nonpartisan, really, uh, way to have a great discussion. So thank you for that moving conversation, and thank you for being here. It means a lot. We have a very small token of our appreciation for each of you. Thank you again, and most of all, thank you to Bill and Barbara Bennett for your support and engagement. Thank you.